Hello and welcome to another episode of Jazzology, presented by Savage Content. I'm your host, Willard Jenkins. We're here alternating Fridays, giving two jazz fans the opportunity to compete against each other for a chance to win $100. Each contestant will be asked a question worth two points. If they are unable to answer correctly, their opponent will have the chance to steal the question for one point. We will ask 10 questions, and at the end of the 10 questions, the person with the lowest score will get a bonus question for the opportunity to tie the score. If they're successful, the game will go to sudden death. Each contestant will take turns trying to answer the multiple choice questions until we have a winner. And now let's meet this week's contestants. Our reigning champion from our episodes prior to the last episode is Joe Petricelli, the executive director of the Jazz Foundation of America, with responsibilities in program development, fundraising, production, and financial management. Joe, tell us about the the uh, relief album that the Jazz Foundation of America has released. Well, great to be here, Willard. Thanks for asking. Uh, this is a very meaningful uh, project and appropriate to share today because uh, my my counterpart, um, my opponent, uh, it, Hank Steamer wrote the liner notes for this and it was like a really uh, great collaboration. But uh, I'll share, I'm gonna show you the, the cover and uh, this is like our kind of rare um, situation where uh, Mac Avenue released this, and it's an all-star benefit album for our Musicians Emergency Fund. If, as you can see, featuring John Batiste, Kenny Garrett, Herbie Hancock, Hiromi, Esperanza Spalding, Leah Genovese, and more. And it actually features tracks from Blue Note, from Verve, from Concord, from the JFA archives, from None Such, and from Mac Avenue. So it, it's un previously unreleased tracks or uh, new new recordings uh, from the past couple of years and benefiting Jazz Foundation's programs that provide emergency relief to musicians in crisis. So uh, well, it's not, it's, it's, it, it sounds also like a, a, a collaboration, which doesn't happen that often, but sounds like a collaboration between record labels. It Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's a rare collaboration. I think the last time we saw something like this was 20 plus years ago around the Ken Burns jazz documentary. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, this is the greatest kind of surge in, in support uh, for the foundation from the labels and in, in as long as I've been at, at JFA and it came at a time when we really needed it. And um, certainly everyone uh, understands the urgency of you know, providing a safety net for, for artists in difficult times. So uh, the, the collaboration was, uh, was a natural one and, uh, really exciting to be a part of it. All right. Joe, we have a, a, a really outstanding co competitor for you. <laughs> I, so, I you, so, you know just a little bit, but our reigning champ from our previous episode is Hank Steamer. Hank is a senior music editor at Rolling Stone magazine. He's written about music professionally for more than 15 years, and he runs Heavy Metal Bebop, an interview series dedicated to the intersections of jazz and heavy metal. So, you know, with that in mind, Hank, I got to ask you, what do you see as the intersections between jazz and heavy metal? Um, you know, I think that when I started uh, working on the series, um, it kind of had to do with uh, you know, I'm I'm a big I'm a big metal fan as well as jazz, and I was going out to, you know, different metal shows, and I started to see people like uh, Craig Taborn, the piano player, um, Dan Weiss, the drummer, people like that. I would see them out at the shows, and realize that this younger generation was was being very influenced by um, the younger generation of sort of like you know cutting edge jazz figures was being in, very influenced by metal, and then kind of taking it all the way back, you find that you know, like, let's say a band like Black Sabbath, who's sort of credited as, as kind of like you know, with the creation of heavy metal, those guys were, you know, especially the drummer, Bill Ward, grew up listening to big band jazz, like Gene Krupa, things like that. And then also you can kind of move forward a couple of years to things like Mavishna Orchestra, where there's kind of a collision between 
some of the heavy rock ideas and and the and the advanced like post miles um you know electric jazz and then there's there's you know points along the way kind of in that whole kind of 50 year span between let's say uh, the first Mahavish, you know, Sabbath or Mahavishnu and something like Dan Weiss's Stair Baby Band, um, which some people might be familiar with on Pi Recordings. Um, and yeah, there's just all kinds of strange like intersections between those two genres that it might not be necessarily obvious on the surface. So I've, I've been kind of exploring that for a while. All right. You guys ready for the questions? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, well Joe, you're up at the plate first. Which of the following jazz musicians was born Melvin Sokoloff in Buffalo, New York. Was it A, Mel Lasty, B, Melvin Sparks, C, Mel Powell, or D, Mel Lewis? Wow. This is a, this is a tough one. <laughs> um, and well, you're I, a returning uh, champ. We got to be tough on you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to get strong. Um, you know, I uh, I love these musicians. I, Melvin Sparks was a great buddy of the Jazz Foundation. He did his his last uh, gig ever uh, was um, in our Music in the Schools program back in 2010. But I, my pretty uninformed guess on this one is going to be D. Mel Lewis. Oh, man. That is correct. That is correct. Although, although Mr. T jumped in there unexpectedly. <laughs> you are correct. Yes, indeed. And Joe scores first. Nice. Right, you ready? Sure. Okay. Singer Catherine Russell's mother, bassist Carlene Ray, was a member of what famous band? Was it A, Lionel Hampton, B, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, C, Count Basie, or D, Diva? Um, I'm going to guess uh, B, International Sweethearts of Rhythm. That is correct. You know, Hank, you, you've done a pretty good job of guessing. At least you're telling us that you're guessing. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, trying, to figure, I'm trying to figure out where the guessing begins and the knowledge. Well, yeah. It's, you know, you know, it's, how do you balance those two? Uh, that's, well, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, but that a, is correct, Hank. <laughs> Joe, really? which of the following contemporary jazz piano players broadcast a popular series of virtual performances from their apartment during the pandemic? Was it A, Helen Sun, B, Aaron Parks, C, Emmett Cohen, or D, Robert Glasper? There have been so many great live streams in the past couple of years, but one of the uh, one of the ones that really uplifted me most, and it's on at the top of my mind because we had a Jazz Foundation benefit at City Winery last night, and Mr. Johnny O'Neill performed, and Johnny's of course been a regular guest with C, Mr. Emmett Cohen, and his weekly live streams. Yep. With all the yups, every yup in the uphill. So what, uh, um, we got to break the ice here, okay? You are correct, Hank. I mean, Joe, you are correct. The answer is C, Emmett Cohen. Emmett has done a wonderful series of, of, of live performances during these pandemic times from his apartment. Hank, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Hank, Grammy-winning vocalist, Cecile McLaurin Salvant is from what city? Is it A, Dallas, B, New York, C, Brooklyn, D, Paris, or E, Miami? 
Uh, that's a tough one. I I remember reading a profile of her, and I think the answer is D. Paris. All right. Well, Joe, you got a chance to steal this one. That was incorrect. Wow. I'll repeat the question once again. And remember, this is one of the participants in your relief album. Mm. <laughs> Grammy winning vocalist Cecile McLaurin Salvant is from what city? Is it A, Dallas, B, New York, C, Brooklyn, and we've eliminated Paris, mm. or E, Miami? Wow, this is, this is a, a tough one. I I tend to think of Cecile coming from a land and place like the beyond time. So <laughs> uh, terrestrial cities. Right. Um I'm I'm guessing again, but I'm gonna and I know she's I know she lives here in New York, but I'm gonna guess Miami E. Yeah. No. Yeah. That is correct. Nice. Cecile is from Miami, Florida. Okay, Joe, you're up next again. Joe, who was the vocalist on the Wynton Marsalis Pulitzer Prize winning oratorio known as Blood on the Fields? Okay. Was that A, Dee Dee Bridgewater, B, Cassandra Wilson, C, Nora Jones, or D, Diane Reeves? Um, I don't know this this piece of music as well as I as well as I should, but I I do believe it is B. Cassandra Wilson. Hey, you over there? Let me tell you something. Yup. Yep. You are <laughs> correct. <laughs> you I are correct, so. <laughs> Jazzology is brought to you by Savage Content, an exciting new purveyor of quality music programming. From podcasts to live performances and interviews, Savage Content offers an eclectic mix of curated entertainment programming for all music lovers. Be sure to follow Savage Content on social media to hear about our latest releases. And now it's time to ask our contestants our favorite question. One of the things that's happened at Savage Content is that Savage Content has hosted two essay contests asking contestants how they fell in love with jazz. Over each episode of Jazzology, we like to pose that question to our contestants. Hank, how did you fall in love with jazz? Um, it was it was really through, um, there, there was, uh, some friends had recommended me some jazz records, um, I think in like early high school, and it was things like Kind of Blue and uh, maybe some Monk records and things like that, which which I enjoyed, but they didn't quite captivate me. And then I, it was definitely through. I was in like a doctor's office waiting room, and there was a um, an article, like sort of a, a primer on like uh, I think like avant garde jazz, and it, there was some mention of or the free jazz album by Ornette Coleman, and I was intrigued by the description, and I bought it. I I was. You know, couldn't really make heads or tails of it. But then after that, I went out and bought Shape of Jazz to Come, and that record immediately clicked. And it was like things like Lonely Woman and Peace on that record. Like I just immediately loved the sound of every composition on that record, every musician. And then I kind of just started following all those players. Well, that's, you know, that, that, that's interesting because would you say that someone uh, with your interest in punk rock and in heavy metal, would you say that someone like that, for someone like that, a good entry point into jazz might be some of the more edgy, uh, so-called avant-garde side of jazz? I definitely think so. When I was that young, I don't think I was prepared to appreciate the subtlety of a record like Kind of Blue, um, mm -hmm. which I absolutely love now. But I think I did need something that had a little bit more kind of like teeth to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that definitely things like that and Albert Eiler and um, and yeah, absolutely. Th th that that was that was a better entry point for me as a young person coming from where I was coming from. And then later, you know, 
came to appreciate kind of the whole scope of the music, but that's what I needed at that time to kind of enter the door. So it took the edgy stuff to bring yeah. you into the in, into the more classic side. Absolutely. And then okay. I got into all of it. Yeah. Well, Joe, tell us how you fell in love with jazz because I, you know, I you, we talked earlier. You would you you come from a similar bank background as Hank musically. How did you fall in love with jazz? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unsurprisingly, I I kind of you know found my way into into the jazz world uh, through a similar path, and it was really uh, in early high school, like sophomore year, uh, 15 years old, and um, I had been up to that time uh, really deeply interested in, in you know, punk rock and hardcore music and um but a, a dear friend of mine austin golding came home from uh winter break uh, or for winter break from his school with a stack of albums from uh the uh, radio station there and in among them was Ornette's Free Jazz. Another was that collection, the major works of John Coltrane, which included uh, Ascension and Ohm and Kulise Mama, and then uh, Bitches Brew as well. So it was kind of a, a sampler of uh, you know these these more sort of avant-garde and then of course fusion style um, sounds, and that was uh, that was the that was the gateway into exploring the the. The, the, the wide rich history of, of jazz and, and I think back to that time I mean part of falling in love with jazz was definitely uh, in it it helped to have a lot of encouragement from uh, from people who you know saw my interest who I approached about my interest and then uh, kind of helped me access it more and you know I think that you know ultimately sort of jazz lovers and sort of Speaking broadly internationally, it's this kind of you know, it's a tight, it's a tight knit coterie, you know, uh, with this kind of shared, shared language and shared sense of appreciation. And so, you know, I really grateful to these, you know, uh, friends. Uh, you know, my friend, one friend had a teacher who took me and two buddies to come down to the city from Connecticut to see Elvin Jones Jazz Machine at uh, Blue Note, you know, circa 1996. That was like my first jazz show think about like teachers who made uh who dubbed cassettes of like west montgomery for me and you know another uh friend's parents actually started the litchfield uh, jazz festival and i remember volunteering there and you know that first year seeing christian mcbride and the late thomas capen and and uh, yeah i've been to that festival yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um those are really uh, special you know, important moments well, you know, this is really interesting to hear hear both of you guys' perspectives on on how you came to jazz because it seems you it's somewhat similar. Uh, you both have you have kind of similar backgrounds in terms of rock music. Yeah, and then it took it took kind of the edgier side of the music to bring you into the jazz side. Well, I should say too, at a certain point, we I mean, we went to we we met each other in college around 1999, um, and the two of us immediately started sharing you know sharing our knowledge I, I i think i was less far along in my journey through it but definitely uh joe and our mutual friend russell baker and some other people and and russell and i were both involved in wkcr um at, at in, in college and yeah we were all kind of you know it was like became like a pool of knowledge that i think has continued on over time well you tell you what hank Going back to the questions, I'm going to take you now to the classic side. Okay. All right. The late great vocalist, Sarah Vaughn, who joined the Ancestors in 1990, was known among musicians as A, the divine one, B, the great one, C, Sweet Sarah, or D, Sassy. Uh, I believe the answer is D. Yep. Yep. You guys are killing me today, Hank. <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer is D. Sassy. And you know, I thought I had a little curveball in there because the old, the, the late great television personality Dave Garraway nicknamed her the Divine One. Oh, okay. She was, known among, she was known among some people as the divine one, right. but amongst musicians, ah. she was always known as sassy. That's a, that's a great question, yeah. 
So the question, the the, the direct answer, the, the correct answer to that question is D, sassy. And thank you, you got that one. Joe, you're up next. Okay. Which drummer became famous for his drum solo on the Benny Goodman performance of Sing, Sing, Sing? Was it A, Gene Krupa, B, Mel Lewis, C, Dave Tuff, or D, Buddy Rich? Um, well, before I answer this, I'm going to plug another of my favorite drummers, and that, that is my uh, worthy adversary, Mr. Hank Steamer. <laughs> I had another bit of show and tell. As we mentioned in the pre-show, Hank and I play in a band called Stats together, and this is an album called Mercy um, that we released in 2015. And uh, I didn't notify Bandcamp that I'd be advertising this, so <laughs> the server won't crash. But, um, this the second track on here, you know, of which I'm a co-composer, and whose title NTD stands for Not That Deep, and was inspired by uh, none other than Henry Threadgill. That's actually the theme music for uh, Heavy Metal Bebop. So we play our version of Heavy Metal Bebop on here. Um, you may want to use some of that info for future trivia questions. <laughs> and uh, I will go with A, Gene Krupa. That is correct. The answer is Gene Krupa played the drum solo on Benny Goodman's classic Sing, Sing, Sing. Okay, Hank. We're still on the drumming side, okay? That's good for me. I like that. Yeah, 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 I got that, you know, because you hadn't said before that you were a drummer, but I yeah. got that now. Which of the following Hall of Fame rock drummers Ooh. made several jazz recordings? Was it A, John Bonham, B, Mitch Mitchell, C, Keith Moon, or D, Ginger Baker? Uh, I'll say before I answer that I, I wish that we had those from A, B, and C, but we don't. We have them from Ginger Baker, so it's D. <laughs> yep, that is correct. The answer is Ginger Baker. The tempestuous Ginger Baker made yeah. I, made several jazz recordings, and in, in, in fact, I, I think his. His last jazz recording was with the, the now late trumpeter Ron Miles and mm -hmm. Bill Frizzell, among others. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, which jazz writer founded the Institute of Jazz Studies on Rutgers University's Newark campus? Was it A, Dan Morgenstern, B, Leonard Feather, C, Marshall Stearns, or D, Ira Gittler? Um, I know that Dan Morgenstern was the longtime director, of course, who really brought that the IJS to such great prominence. But I do believe it was founded by C, Marshall Stearns. That is incorrect. Ooh. Hank. Which jazz writer founded the Institute of Jazz Studies on Rutgers University's Newark campus? Was it A, Dan Morgenstern, B, Leonard Feather, C, Marshall Stearns, or D, Ira Gittler? Now, now, as a writer, you know you got to get this one right. I think it was Dan Morgenstern. I'm going to have to go with A. Yep, that is a big yep. It was indeed Dan Morgenstern. And here was the trick to that one, Joe. The trick is that, yes, Dan Morgenstern founded it, but it was Marshall Stern's collection that, uh, was, that was the foundation of that foundation. Gotcha. So Dan Morgenstern was the founder. Hank, what NEA jazz master made several recordings of Jimi Hendrix songs? Was it A, Miles Davis, B, Chick Corea, C, Gil Evans, 
or D, Thad Jones? Uh, it was C, Gil Evans. Yep, yep, that is correct. It was Gil Evans made several recordings of Jimi Hendrix music. <laughs> and now we are at 9-9. Nine, nine. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at bonus question time with a tie. And since Hank went last, we'll give Joe the first shot at a bonus question. Joe, the emerging tenor saxophonist, Melissa Aldana, is a native of what country? Is it A, Italy, B, Chile, C, Argentina, or D, Brazil? B, Chile. It was indeed Chile. That was B Chile. It was that was the correct answer. Those sounds are always so ambiguous. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I was. <laughs> well, anytime you hear "yep," that means you got it. Good or bad. <laughs> okay, let's see what you got, Hank. The tune "This I Dig of You" was written and first performed by which of the following tenor saxophonists? And this is strictly a bonus question because Joe has won. <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe won as a result of that last bonus question. But I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm give, yeah. give you one last shot at a bonus question. Just at, this is like just for Yeah, this is just for dignity. Just, this is just for, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, we're just hanging out. <laughs> and, I'll, I'll, and I'll repeat the question again. The tune, This I Dig of You, was written and first performed by which of the following tenor saxophones? Was it A, Hank Mobley, B, Benny Golson, C, Dexter Gordon, or D, John Coltrane? Hmm. I think, um, man, this is a tough one. Um, I'm going to have to go with, uh, I'm going to have to go with B. B, Benny Golson? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that was a, that was just for fun anyway. <laughs> because, uh, because Joe Joe has won. Wait, was that correct? Just just so I know. No, it was not. It okay, was so not it was E. Correct. It was E, right? The correct answer. Hey. The correct answer was A. Hank Mobley. Ah, uh, okay. Hank Mobley wrote that tune. This I dig of you. That's that's one of my fun with you guys here. <laughs> Soul Station. Congratulations to Joe Petricelli on your win. Thank you. And if anyone watching would like to become a contestant on Jazzology, we'd love to hear from you. Follow us on social media, at Savage Content, that's at S-A-V-A-G-E-C-N-T-N-T, -T, as you see on the screen, and send us a message letting us know. You must be 18 years or older, and thanks so much to Joe Petricelli and Hank Schneemer, and to everyone who joined us today. Remember, if you can check us out every other Friday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you miss the show live, you can find the archive on our Jazzology YouTube channel. Now, Joe, I got to ask you, as our returning champion and as our champion for today, what do you find the big, to be the biggest challenge of competing on Jazzology? <laughs> uh, look, I, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, I, I, I do a little preparation and, and I think the, the challenge is re reckoning with the, uh, the incredible history and tapestry of, of music over 
you know, a, a century plus at this point and, and just you know, trying to keep, keep it all, keep it all in balance and keep it all in our heads. Well, I, I got to ask and you. Willard, your expertly crafted questions yeah. are the true, are the true challenge. <laughs> that divine one one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hank, how do you, what, what do you find to be your biggest challenge in competing on jazz out? I, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's just that thing of like, you know, we all have our uh, strong points and weak points, you know, whatever our knowledge base is. And I think just like covering, I mean, yeah, I would just say for myself, like jazz, jazz vocals aren't necessarily a, a like a huge emphasis for me in my, you know, background and listening. So, so I was a little, you know, um, tentative about some of those questions. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it, it just yeah it takes a really long time to become like an expert on on everything that you're that you're asking about and it's actually really it's fun to be kind of like you know challenge kind of, kind of pushed into those areas and, and made to think about you know personalities you might not have uh explored that much so you know we all we all do our best but you can't know everything well thank you guys once again and joe we'll see you next time hopefully as our returning champion Thanks to Joe Petricelli and Hank Steamer and the Savage Content guys. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Looking forward to it. Bye. Congrats, Joe. Bye. <laughs> yeah.